Hello everybody, my name is Dratnos and welcome to a video about the Thundering Affix. Actually about an article uh, that myself and my friend Krista wrote for Wowhead with help from Warcraft Logs uh, and also some interviews from Tobo and Roybin who are two very high M plusers as well. Uh, and so for this post, you may know, you may know if you've watched some of my videos, I don't have a super high opinion of Thundering. I tried to put that aside and uh, just ask and answer some questions using Warcraft logs and using just a bunch of log runs. We got a huge sample of like 30,000 runs uh, from Warcraft logs over, it was like all right after the tank change so that Thundering no longer targeted the tank as well. So uh, on a consistent version of the Apex. Uh, and so let's go through and talk about this post. If you want to read it, I'll of course link it in the description below as well. Uh, but the basic question is how much extra damage, well, one of the basic questions, one of the first ones we answered was how much extra damage are people actually getting from their thundering marks? Uh, and the way we did this was we used this filter expression that you can use on Warcraft logs. Uh, and if you do the, if you use this, you can see exactly how much damage people did while they had either of the thundering marks active on themselves. Uh, and then, so if you do this, you see how much damage they did with those marks, and then you can multiply that by uh, 0.23 roughly and you get the amount of damage that was thanks to the thundering and the basic answer was across our sample people in most most key levels most puggy kind of keys were getting about two percent uh damage from those marks two percent of like like they did two percent more damage throughout the dungeon because of the the globals that were empowered by those marks as we got to some of the higher keys in our sample that number was getting to three percent I have personally looked through some of the very top logged runs on Warcraft logs. I've seen numbers as high as four and a half, five percent even uh, of their, you know, uh, of bonus damage from thundering. Uh, but, and I assume that maybe, maybe for some MDI teams, it would even go above that five percent mark uh, on some of their best runs. But generally, the number here is pretty small. Uh, it's pretty close to zero, and this is actually a pretty generous way of calculating the thundering bonus damage as well, because. Let's say, hypothetically, you would have done 10 globals without Thundering, and then because of Thundering, you do 9 globals that are more powerful, and then you have to move for a global to go and clear your Thundering. Well, we're not going to see that you like missed a global. We're just going to see, okay, these 9 globals did more damage, and then we're going to calculate that as bonus damage from Thundering. But what we're not going to actually see in our analysis at all here is that you may have lost globals due to movement, due to... Uh, due to trying to clear the thundering. Uh, and so I, I think this is actually a generous way of looking at it. Another thing to note as well is that thundering itself does technically add 5% health to all mobs in the dungeon. I don't really think of that as something that's too much to do with thundering because, you know, they could have very easily just taken that out of the affix and baked it into keys. And I guess it would have affected keys below level 10, but it, it would have been the same. They, they kind of tinker with the relative health and damage of mobs all the time. Uh, but if you do look at it that way, then you could say, okay, Thundering is... The, the bonus damage from this affix is almost never more than the health added by the affix. I personally don't think that's the biggest knock against Thundering because, you know, affix... Like, there, there have been a lot of great affixes that do slow you down more than they speed you up. After Encrypted and Shrouded, we were kind of used to affixes that made you faster through the dungeon, right? Like, both of those affixes, you would choose to put them on your key because they would... They would mean you'd complete the key faster and at a higher level. Uh, but Thundering certainly isn't one of them. But I don't think that's the reason Thundering is bad or a reason Thundering is bad. Because uh, that's true. Like Reaping also, you would never choose to put on your key. I guess maybe you would in some ridiculous funnel situation or just because it was fun, right? But it would slow you down. Uh, and that that the, the fact that, yeah, Thundering almost certainly does slow you down, it doesn't... That's not the problem, though, with it. Uh, okay, so we then also looked by spec. Here you can see this beautiful color coding... Uh, that has ranged DPS are the bright red, melee DPS are the dark red, tanks are the blue, and healers are the green. So uh, some patterns become pretty apparent here when you look at this. First of all, ranged are doing especially well. When you look at the three top range specs on this as well, Affliction, Balance, and Shadow, these specs do a lot of their damage through dots. When you look at the healers, okay, almost all the healers are kind of sucking at this. So the healers that are middle of the pack or higher, Rest of Druid and Disc, do a lot of their damage through dots as well, right? Uh, so 
it seems like the kind of metrics that mean that you're going to get a lot of bonus damage from Thundering are if you're ranged, if you do a lot of damage with dots, uh, those are like pluses. If you're a healer, uh, that's a minus uh, on in terms of how likely it is that you're going to get a lot of damage out of this Thundering affix. Uh, and... Again, this does kind of line up with, you know, if you're if you're moving to clear thundering, your dots are still ticking, right? And so that's probably that's part of why it's going to look good on this metric. Again, note that this is not factoring in stuff like lost globals uh, and how you know the counterfactual, how much damage you would have been doing if there'd just been no thundering proc at all. Uh, it's hard to like. Well, all we know is if you press the same buttons and moved in the same way, but obviously you wouldn't have to move in the same way uh, if you didn't have thundering to go clear. Uh, then we also looked at deaths. This was an area that, for me, was surprising, because anecdotally, I feel like if I get stunned by thundering, I'm dead a lot of the time. Uh, and here we found, okay, the so the blue is how likely you are to die within five seconds, or two seconds of getting stunned by Primal Overload, so that's not the swirlies, but the the debuff expiring. Red is how likely you are to die within five seconds, and yellow is how likely you are to die within 10 seconds. Uh, the 24, 25, 26 level here kind of highlights one of the weaknesses of our, our data set, which is we're only looking at completed runs that were logged and finished in time, or finished under 140% of the timer, actually. So uh, it could be depleted, but depleted such that you'd still get score, uh, which I guess at the 24, 25, 26 level, you also get penalized on score on that, but you still get some score from those, uh, whereas it becomes zero score after 140%. So that was, I'm not sure why that was where we set the line. I think that, that was something to do with how the sample was generated uh, by the Warcraft logs uh, folks. But either way, there were there aren't that many runs that are logged. People don't usually log the runs that, there aren't that many logged runs that are like 170% over the timer anyways. But that the main problem is if you hearthed out of your run, we're not going to see it. Uh, at runs where people hearthed out of them aren't showing up in our sample, uh, which you know, there's a good chance that if you get stunned in a 24 key, you're hearthing out of it uh, in a way that makes it so that we get this kind of survivor bias uh, that that makes it look like it's less lethal in these higher in the very highest keys when in fact it's so lethal that it pulls you out of our sample uh, is my is my suspicion of what's going on here. Our sample also we only had like six or seven 26 keys in our sample, uh, so the, the 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 we included it for completely completeness in this graph, but. Uh, I think the the main trend, rather than saying like, oh, it's it's somehow safer in high keys, is just that like, okay, it goes. You go from being about twenty percent to die if you get stunned in a ten to being about forty percent to die if you get stunned in a twenty, uh, and that kind of lines up. I, I that is still surprisingly low for me, I guess, in a twenty. But uh, the thing is, if you get stunned and then you hit bubble, you would still count as getting stunned for this, right? It, it would still uh, as long as that primal overload debuff got applied to you. That was what we. Uh, that was how we detected it in our. This is this is the API call uh, that we used. I I actually wrote all of this stuff. Uh, Warcraft logs they they provided like a skeleton of the way to do an API call. So like this stuff with uh, this this stuff wasn't me, but I wrote all this stuff up here because uh, I, I did a little computer science in college. Not very well. This took a long time actually for me to for me to figure out how to do this, but it was really, it was actually really fun. Uh, and yeah, we were able to to look through the logs and basically see if you got a primal overload stun. So I guess if you pre-immuned, you probably wouldn't even show up in this. But if you got stunned and immuned, it would still count as getting stunned, and then you probably wouldn't die. So that might be what's pulling this percentage down. I'm not sure. Uh, and again, it might also just be because people are hearthing out a lot of the times when they die after getting stunned, and then their their runs aren't showing up in our sample. Uh, okay, we also looked at how often some different specs got stunned. Interestingly, a lot of tanks were very high on this list. I didn't color code this one in the same way that I color coded this one because that's actually really annoying and took a long time to do that on Google Sheets. It, really, it took like 15 minutes or something and it was really obnoxious actually to, to do that. So, uh, But you can see here, Guardian, Prop Paladin, Vengeance, Prop Warrior, uh, Blood DK, Brewmaster. So like six of the top 10 basically are tank specs in terms of how frequently they are getting stunned in any given key in our sample. What this is is like uh, the... If you ran one key, how many primal overload stuns happened in that key for that person? Uh, and the so like the average guardian got stunned 0.6 times per key, whereas the average sub in our sample only got sun, stunned 0.2 times per key, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? When you look at it, you know, what tools does a guardian druid have if they notice there's about to be a stun happening and like the, the two people they could clear with are both out at range? 
bull rush if they're a high mountain tauren right or shift out of bear form and wild charge that person right that those are not good answers right whereas if you're a sub rogue you can always click on somebody and shadow step them uh, or cloak of shadows the debuff on it before before it goes off on yourself right so uh that kind of makes sense here the fact that all the tanks are near the top i think it is often like obviously tanks don't have to clear in theory because you always get one of the marks that is the three rather than the two but if you are put in a spot where the the clear happens between the two melee dps and now you are linked with the two ranged as the tank you're kind of at their mercy right like you're you're relying on them to notice and get to you because you're not just going to run out and frontal the whole group and and clear with them which i think is why you see so many uh the, the tanks are seeing so many of these stuns as well uh on this okay then we also looked at how much your timer got inted by getting a stun uh, and basically the answer was roughly 5% of the dungeon's timer would disappear if you got stunned uh, in a dungeon. So, uh, again, on average across across our sample. Again, this is, some, this is probably a generous estimate because runs where it was so bad you hearthed out aren't showing up in our sample. Uh, but, yeah, you can see in a 20-plus key, you know, the timer is barely under the timer, and then as soon as you get a stun... It's over the timer. You're, you're likely to have now depleted. Uh, and as soon as you've gotten two stuns, you're, you know, well over the timer. Uh, and similarly, in a, in a 15 to 19 key in our sample, uh, zero stuns was likely timed. One stun was barely timed. Uh, and then two stuns was probably a deplete. So a very punishing thing to happen for each of these uh, stun events that would happen. Uh, then we took a look at affixes and dungeons to see if there were some dungeons or some affixes that were especially bad with this. One thing that Krista noticed about this as well, and uh, did like a regression thing to prove, it didn't make it into this article, but we did do, was there's actually an inverse correlation between how many stuns happen on a given affix or dungeon and how likely you are to die within 10 seconds afterwards in that dungeon, which means like the more stuns that you're getting the less lethal they were in our sample for a given affix or for a given key. The keys that were the the stunniest were the least lethal with the stuns uh, and vice versa. You can kind of see that here, right? Like, look, explosive is one of the most lethal in terms of how many deaths happened within the 10 seconds after a stun, but is the affix on that, on that level row that has the least primal overloads. We didn't include this because we thought that was probably largely, again, maybe to do with people hearthing out uh, in the more lethal ones giving us this kind of survivorship bias thing that we couldn't really think of a way to really test for or, or investigate further. So uh, that was, but that was, that was the interesting thing to note. And looking at this, the takeaways are, you look at the dungeons like, yeah, quarter star shadow and burial grounds, no mechanics going on here. So you don't get very many suns. Uh, and then Algathar, Ruby and temple kind of middle of the pack there and very high in lethality. If you do get stunned uh, and then halls of valor, not good Azure vault, Lots of stuns in these dungeons, but actually not all that many deaths compar by comparison. I mean, if you look at these the death chances here, the, the percentages are actually pretty close, uh, right? It's within a few percent of each other, so the bright red versus bright green even isn't a huge difference over there, whereas, you know, the bright red versus bright green on the number of primal overloads is like twice as many primal overloads per, per key in a vault versus in a court. And then if you look at the affixes... It was kind of weird, like, Bullstring had half as many stuns happening on it as Raging Week, uh, which, there were actually multiple different Bullstring and Raging, like, every affix had multiple weeks represented in our sample, but I'm still thinking maybe what was going on here was just our, like, the Bullstring Weeks were later on in our sample, and people were maybe better at playing against the affix. I'm not sure. that This is a, a surprising chart to me, so... Uh, I yeah still don't really have a great explanation for exactly what's going on here with because I am surprised just that the numbers are so different in the number the average primal overloads per dungeon based on these affixes. Uh, best guess is maybe it's the hearthing out thing on on the different weeks like right, right? like maybe I don't even know. Uh, and then I'm not as surprised by the fact that the primal overload death chance is is deviating by a few percent because again it's not actually like it's not like you're double as likely to die on any of these weeks as the others. It's uh, it's much closer on that on that side of things, and then we had this cool these cool interviews with Tobo and Roybin as well. Which I actually think that the high level high level keys is the place where Thundering does the best because in high level keys there actually is stuff that's like worth playing around, especially especially like MDI keys. Uh, there's stuff worth playing around, but like when I've been pushing title this season, there has been some spots where 
you know, we've done things around thundering to try and minimize or maximize the upside, which is rare. I would still say 95% of my, my interaction with thundering in pushing title has been minimizing the downside rather than maximizing the upside. But there has actually been some maximizing of the upside, right? Like, hey, let's hold our lust for this thundering. Hey, let's let's hold our trinkets or whatever for this thundering. Uh, let's let's drop combat or make sure we don't drop combat for a little bit to set up our next thundering. Those sorts of things uh, we've done a tiny bit of, and that's that's kind of cool to do with the affix. But it feels like in almost all cases, when you, whenever you think about thundering, and it's like, oh, what is the right play to do with thundering here? The answer is okay, just clear it, right? Like, you're like, oh, okay, we've got thundering and there's this mechanic coming up in 10 seconds. Can we hold it? And the answer is just, just clear it. Just clear it right before uh, before Laymore comes out with a stupid expo- explosive brand, right? And you're just like, uh, you're, you're screwed if you've still got thundering with somebody else there and if you didn't notice it ahead of time. And so most of my interaction with thundering when pushing high keys has been, okay, this is a pack or this is a boss where you need to clear our well in advance if this mechanic is anywhere close to happening because it's going to kill you if not. Uh, so, that is a quick look through this article. A uh, quick look at some of the process we used to get all this data, process it. Uh, big thanks again to Warcraft Logs, uh, and Yaks in particular, Warcraft Logs, for helping us get all this together. I uh, hope this was an interesting video, an interesting post. Um, certainly, you know, there. I, I, I do kind of, I kind of wish we'd tried harder to try and investigate the like lost globals thing but i think it would have been really hard to do but i have some ideas for how we could have maybe done that that uh, retroactively um like looking at you know just like how many casts people are getting in the while they have this buff up versus you know per like cast per second versus cast per second outside of their thundering buff uh and see how those are comparing but that was something we didn't do that would have been interesting to do on this but the tldr is yeah thundering Thundering upside is largely, uh, it's quite low, and my advice, obviously advice in Thundering, not super important, because Thundering is almost over, it's kind of more just looking at it retrospectively, but uh, it does, this does kind of support the idea that usually the best way to play around Thundering is not to quibble over whether you're going to get 2 or 2.5% damage in your key, uh, that does become necessary at the very highest keys, but the big thing to do is make sure you're avoiding having those th- stuns, because the stuns convert to deaths at a much, much higher rate than those extra few seconds convert to more damage. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Bye.